The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. for what God has for us today. We thank you that you began a good work or continuing that good work in us. And that God, there's even now a spark of hope, of open to God, open to life, open to one another. There's a new level of openness that you who began that good work is going to continue it. And that we don't look to the left or to the right that basically what God is saying is that pay attention as you see that the fields are already white for the harvest. For thus says the Spirit of the Lord, for I have drawn you and knit you together, that I have placed within your life divine appointments, these divine appointments to be divine connections. These divine connections are going to order and structure a symphony, a tapestry of my making, says the Lord, and we're going to release and unleash even upon this community and in Charlotte in particular in that place of your jurisdiction to fulfill the purposes of God. For I see rings and circles of influence coming together, and they're like chain mail. And the chain mail is going to be both a defensive weapon against uh, uh, negative environments and hostile activity. It shall protect, but it shall also be the net that shall be capable of holding the harvest of what God is about to do in the days ahead. So let those links be strong. Let those links be God links and be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship has Christ with Belial? I believe that there's a there's a, a, a mistake that's often made that we that we basically can hang with people that are pulling us down. If we're evangelizing them, fine, because greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. But a lot of times, if that's not happening, you may have to be inquiring of the Lord to whether or not that relationship is really for me. And we have to get serious about these things, because um, I believe that God is encouraging us to enter into a divine embrace. That's the message for this morning. Divine embrace. D-I-V-I-N-E. It's an embrace that comes from the Spirit of God, and He wants to hold you. He wants you to be held, and He wants to establish His covenant within us. Within us. We've been, uh, we have a new series out. It'll probably be on the website shortly from the last uh, three messages on holy love. And uh, I believe that the key repetitive statement in the three messages on holy love is that love is continually, passionately reaching out to embrace us for a relationship. Holiness, however, creates distance. And that the kind of embrace that God wants is for us to bridge that gap in the, in the, so that we could be holy as he is holy. And I believe that even some have found themselves hidden for a season, feeling like there's distance from God. I've done everything I know to do, and there's still distance. They look at their circumstances, and they, and they wonder. But God basically is saying it's like the time of the, the Song of Solomon. When she, when she was on her bed, she sought the one she loved. She sought him, but she could not find him. There was, he was hidden for a season, but he was not hidden from her. He was hidden for her. He's waiting for that pursuit to take place, that divine initiative that's on the inside of each every one of us, but yet we must cooperate to it. Because when we find him, we shall not let go. Do you agree? When we find him in new depths of intimacy, we're not going to let go. He's not going to let go of us, and we're not going to let go of him. And God has that ability to hold us strong and complete. And we have to remember that the reason, the reason that, that there is even that hiddenness for a season. And I learned this in my prayer time once, that God would just basically brush across my spirit, like take a feather and just barely touch my spirit. And I'm a heavy sleeper. I don't wake up easy. And in the weight of sleep and the weight of wanting to stay sleeping, 
that little brush would come across my spirit and I learned eventually to just put my foot out of the bed, slide out of bed and commune with God, whether my body was fully awake or not. And sometimes I even fell asleep after I got out of bed and lay on the side of the bed. But nonetheless, God's looking for obedience more than the sacrifice. And I found that when there were times when I was too tired and I'd just go, oh, later, Lord, just later that there was a season to where it was a little harder to find him and a little harder to meet him. He was available, but there was, a, there was some hiddenness. It was for a season, but then there was like a price to pay. Now, you said, let me sleep for a little while, okay? Now I wanna make, I'm gonna cultivate within you a hunger and a desire to pursue me. And I see that story in the bride or the, uh, the uh, Shulamite, and in the Song of Solomon. And it's, it's interesting because then she says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. <laughs> yeah, that was the problem. Um, I was asleep. My body was loud, but my spirit was still functioning. I was asleep, but my heart is awake. It's the voice of my beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. That's the way he talks to us. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? I'm sleeping. I'm tired. What can I? <laughs> but it basically says, I opened when I finally awoke in the morning and I wanted to renew that relationship. It was like I sought him, but I could not find him. It wasn't as easy. And so God wants this divine pursuit in order for the divine embrace to exist. And I don't know about you, but there's pain in separation. If you ever lost a loved one and felt what it felt like on the inside, there's pain in that separation. And basically, uh, even, the, even the Shulamite basically in the Song of Solomon said, you know, uh, Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell them that I am lovesick. And that love sickness is on the inside of us because we are fashioned and fold and, and created for that relationship. And that separation has pain in it. And the way we deal with pain, for the most part, is very few people deal with their pain head on, present it to, to Christ, and then do something constructive with it. And that takes us to Psalm 51. How many know that David was a man who knew that divine embrace in his life? He knew intimacy. He knew God. But then in his sin, there was a separation. And that separation caused him pain. In Psalm 51, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your mercies. Blot out my transgression." He knew that there was something causing distance. Blot out my transgression. That means remove it from the root law book. Uh, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. That, mean, that didn't mean that he lost his, his salvation in, in totality. It's cast me not. I don't want any distance. And everything God's been speaking to us in the last three weeks is that, is that love is reaching out for that intimate embrace and that relationship and holiness creates distance. If there's sin in your life, it separates you from you and your God. And there are, there are many that are actually um, playing uh, in Christianity almost like it's a club or it's a game that they can maintain their sin and still be practicing the presence of God. And God's saying that this is coming to an end and this is coming to a time where that lawlessness must cease because that's what it is, it's lawlessness. And many will say in that day, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? And he said, depart from me, I knew you not. It's not about your giftings. It's not about whether the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. It's, it's about that steadfast intimacy with God and a radical obedience to removing anything that comes between you and your God. And that means anything negative that separates you. There must be that divine embrace that is solid, that is secure, that is brand new. Now, in this uh, blot out, wash and cleanse, 
ultimately what was, what was the purpose. He said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That's the key. That's where we're going. Anything that stands in the way. If your Christianity is humdrum, drudgery, guess what? It's not God. There's some darkness still in you that's separating you from your God because God's will is pleasure. You can't separate that. God's will is joyful. Not to your flesh, but in the spirit. A spirit-ruled person is is joyful and confident that I'm about my father's business. Jesus said, I delight to do thy will. I have food that you know not of. For my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his course. And his will and his pleasure are synonymous. Eventually, uh, we've got two books on uh, the supernatural power of peace, the shalom of God. The second one is going to be the will of God as a river. The will of, will, the will of God as a river is going to be a supernatural flow of divine will. And it's a pleasure river. It's a will that brings delight. It makes glad the city of our God. There's gladness and rejoicing in the will of God. Now, where the difficulty comes, of course, is where my will and his will cross. That's where we apply the cross, all right? Good definition of the cross, where my will and God's will cross, all right? But as we yield to his will, he restores the joy of our salvation. One of the things that God showed me as a, as a young believer, that the will in me was like a bar, a handlebar, and it depended who was in control. It was a scepter of sorts. I could rule as Dennis, even though it's a false rule, because you think you're doing what you want, but the prince of the power of the air causes you to do his will. Even though you think you've got this free will, this free will is only free under a law. And it can be the law of sin and death or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So once I saw that, then I wasn't so proud about my free will. I saw that there's a force above me for good or evil that's ruling my will. Therefore, God showed me that handlebar on the inside. By the way, when you get stressed and you tense up, you're holding that handlebar on the inside. That's your will. That's also the door and you're holding it shut to God. Not real wise, all right? God showed me that what he wanted to do in my life through the finished work of the cross was that I needed a Gethsemane experience of my will to where I quit trying. And to, to this day, I've never been burned out in, as a Christian. I've never been worn out. Physically, yeah. But to be worn out because of trying or striving, it's never happened. Because something happened when I gave him that will, suddenly yielding was far more significant than trying. And I gave him that bar and he said, when you yield your will to me, I work. I will and I perform. And if you give your will to me, that bar, that scepter of self-rule, I'm going to fuse my will with your will and it's going to be a scepter of righteousness and my will then will become a delight. I saw that there, it preceded by a Gethsemane nonetheless, but after the Gethsemane it was nevertheless not my will but thy will be done and that his will actually has power behind it to will and to do. And it flows. You don't make it happen. You don't grunt and groan. You don't try. You trust. And as you trust, that, that artesian well of anointing enables and empowers you. Now, I said that if it changes into a scepter of God's will, then that fusion and union, then that in turn keeps me in the embrace of God. When I find him, like it says in the Song of Solomon, I will not let go. I will not let go. He will not let go of me. Now, if I yield my will to do my own will, he will let go and let me do my will, but there's going to be distance. And God is saying that divine embrace is to close the gap from any distance in our lives. God basically is saying that <clears throat> he wants to bring us to the place of perfect revelation. And Psalm 19 is what kind of triggered this, this, this whole thing. 
And I was reading it in the message because it says, God's glory is on tour in the skies. He exhibits across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes in the morning and Professor Knight instructs in the evening. Night and day is speaking without words. The whole creation is declaring the handiwork of God and that he is a design. You know, people that think that this all just happened without a creator, it's a, find it interesting. It'd be like taking a bunch of vegetables and fruits and throwing it in a blender and turning it on frappe and expecting a garden to come out. I mean, it's that illogical. But nonetheless, uh, God is basically speaking. And in Psalm 19... Now, listen to this in the message because I think sometimes we need to hear these words. Most people ignore it when they read this. The law of the Lord is good. The testimonies of the Lord are true. The statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. And they don't pay any attention to what all those different words mean. But the message makes it and brings it into simple English. Listen how beautiful that portion of scripture. This is David in Psalm 19, basically just uh, revealing the perfect revelation of our Jesus, the perfect revelation of God. As a matter of fact, my opinion, the book of Revelations, though they teach it from a historical end times point of view, it's to me, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an internal work before it's an external activity. It's a revelation of Jesus and how he is and how he works in our lives. But anyway, uh, in Psalm 19 in the message, it says the revelation, that's the Torah, the law, the revelation, the divine instruction, Torah, the revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. You want us to take that fragmented, chaotic life and have it pulled together? The Torah is there for that purpose. The law of the Lord is there to pull our lives together. The testimonies, uh, the message calls it the signposts. The signposts, the admonitions, the ordinances, the warnings, the stop signs, the yield signs, all of those are there basically <clears throat> to point the right way, to tell you what to do at any given point in time. So the testimonies of the Lord, the signposts, are admonitions, warnings, ordinances, but they're clear in pointing you on the right road. The life maps, that's statutes. The life maps, I like that term, life maps. Maps, mapping out your life, okay? These life maps, these statues are appointed by God showing you the way to joy. And I love that because that affirms and confirms that the plans that he has for you are for welfare, not calamity, to give you a future and to give you a hope. And that, that it's meant to be, you are meant to enjoy the journey regardless of what happens on the journey. And these life maps or statutes have been appointed by God, they're right. They're right and they're righteous, and they show you the way to joy. The directions of the Lord, we call them commandments. The directions, the authoritative commandments of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold, and it has a lifetime guarantee. Don't you love it? I love this. The decision, we'd call that the judgments, the decision, the sentences, the judicial decisions, the judgments of God are accurate down to the nth degree. So really, the futility of man to argue with it is a, is a waste of time. But God's words better than a diamond set between emeralds. There's more, though, than God's word warns us of danger, and yet he directs us to hidden treasure. That's what today's message is about. He's warning us of the dangers, of the things that separate us, because he wants a holy love. Be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He's basically saying, I, Jehovah, the revealing one, the revelation of God to you. I, Jehovah, the revealing one, your Elohim, your creator God, your covenant-making God is holy, therefore be holy. Anything that he's telling you to do is still, he is still the source of it, or you can't do it. You can't be holy in and of yourselves, but you can allow his holiness to rise up that when he points out, this is light, this is dark, choose light. And when you cooperate with that, his holiness is going to bring a divine embrace that's stronger than anything you've ever known before to make ready a people prepared for the things that are coming. That's why the message was basically repentance. 
Isn't that what John the Baptist did to prepare you for Jesus? He still does the same thing. Prior to an awakening, a revival, or a move of God, there is a voice, a trumpet, a prophetic voice that says, make ready a people prepared. I was told last Sunday by a friend of ours, he says, you keep using that word strategy, that you love strategy. You're not a strategist. I got rebuked last Sunday. You're not a strategist, you're a tactician. A strategist, there's a lot of prophetic voices that are actually giving strategy but they're not giving the how-tos to fulfill that strategy. Like, thus saith the Lord, do this. And the rest of the churches go, how? We need tacticians. We really do that. Not because I feel like I'm one, but I've always been really deeply impressed when God would give David even a different type of strategy in a different type of situation. He didn't just have canned answers. It was, it was vital that means life or death. It was vital he had inquired of God and required of God in every situation. He didn't think he knew because of previous stuff. Saul did that. That was Saul's mistake. Saul flew by the seat of his pants. He thought he had enough expertise that he could just figure things out. Do you, do you battle with figuring things out? That's for someone watching on Ustream right now. Stop it. Stop figuring things out and inquire of the Lord because therein lies real freedom. Now, here we go. So, what God is basically saying, even in Psalm 19, as beautiful as this was, talking about the perfect revelation of God, it enlightens the eyes, it makes wise the simple, it does all these good things. This, these are the statutes, the, uh, the commandments, the testimonies, the law of the Lord, His judgments are pure. All these things are all wonderful altogether. But basically, David entered into something that we've taught for uh, decades now from Psalm 19, that in the latter verses of Psalm 19, he talks about what we call intentional sanctification. In the midst of the glory of, of finding that relationship with him to where you know that you're touching spirit to spirit, he didn't stop there. He said, I revealed to me, search my heart for secret faults. You want that divine embrace and you want to get closer to God. You can't just wait till you have a meltdown. Wait till you have a bad day. Wait till you have a problem and then seek God. You're going to have to say, when I'm on top of it, when I'm worshiping, when I'm in the joy of the Lord, when I experience it, I'm still going to say, God, search my heart for any anxious thoughts or hurtful ways. Search my heart for secret sin. Secret sin means that 400 billion non-conscious thought patterns. Not, I'm going to think about this. But let God search the heart and let him look for secrets. And David said, I want intentional sanctification. I'm doing wonderful. I'm walking in the light that I have, but I want more. I want, a, I want you to have a greater grip on my life. I want that, any distance between us, I want you to search it out and remove the distance that we can be even more closely related into that divine embrace. David was a lover, do you agree? He was a lover of God, man after God's own heart. He, even, in his, even in his last days, he defined himself not as a king or a warrior. He defined himself, I'm, but, I'm the son of Jesse, the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man anointed by God. All he cared about was he knew where he came from, and he knew he was a worshiper. And as a worshiper, he knew he was anointed by God. He didn't do it of himself. He didn't talk about his conquests as king or warrior. He talked about his relationship. He was a lover. And God's basically calling us in this time to intentional sanctification. And the purpose of it is that find secret faults so that I do not commit presumptuous sin. So I don't have big blunders. In other words, so that they don't have rule over me or dominion search out the little foxes in my life that may cause big mistakes down the road. That's intentional sanctification. That's not waiting for a bad day or a meltdown or a particular problem, and then you run for help. This is someone who is passionately pursuing his presence to such a degree that no matter how wonderful they feel like they're doing, they're, God, I want more, 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 and I want more. I want less of me and more of you. And it's going to have to be less of me to have more of you because he can't fill something that's already full of self. Now, 
He also says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19. That therein lies, not only was he searching, but he wanted the heart to match his words. He wanted substance. He wanted demonstration. He wanted a life message more than a bunch of information. He cared about a life message. Jesus was a life message. Not just the words that he spoke, but the life that he lived, the death that he died right? It wasn't just what he said, it was what he lived. And that's ultimately the cry. And I can see why David was a man after God's own heart. Now, in light of all of that, that's the introduction. I want a tactic. How do I, how do I get God's embrace closer? I'm doing the best that I know how. And I believe God's given us a a specific tactic. It's a perhaps an oversimplification, but then again, could it be the simplicity that's in Christ? Huh? Do we need to return to the simplicity that's in Christ? Well, I found a verse in Psalm 51 while I was looking at 19 and 51, and that's that beautiful transition where God was closing the gap. David was was revealing and God was drawing closer, but there required a blotting out, a cleansing and a purging of repentance so that he could restore unto him what? The joy of his salvation. And I believe it's the joy of the salvation, the pleasure, the delight that God has for every one of us. Now, if we're going to do that, we're going to have to get rid of whatever's in the way from the joy of our salvation. I'm not talking about you losing your salvation. I'm talking about the joy of the salvation, the pleasure of his will, the delighting to do his will. If that's missing, There are many, many barriers in your heart if that's missing. You have nowhere near close enough to the kind of relationship that God wants in the days ahead. Now, in in that cleansing and in the reading of Psalm 51, David's repentant chapter, so to speak, verse 10 stood out and God gave a tactic. And listen to the way it's stated. It's actually quite beautiful. Psalm 51.10 in the message, he's crying out to God and he's saying, give me a clean bill of health. God, make a fresh start in me and shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Shape a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. What happened in those seven days in Genesis? Create in me a Genesis week. What took place in those seven days of creation by a creator God, a God of power and might, the Elohim God, the creator God. What did Elohim do in those seven days? David says, I'm a mess I want to come back to you, create or recreate, (laughs) recreate in me. Isn't that the new creation, a recreation? Create in me a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. So I took those seven days and said, let's welcome the Spirit of God to do the seven days on us. Uh Uh-oh. Now, like I said, this is simply the simplicity of Christ. This is not an in-depth theological uh, dissertation here. But on day one, day one, Genesis 1, 1 through 5, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was on the face of, of the deep, and the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. I love it. Day one, What are you doing? What did David do in Psalm 19? Search me, O God, for secret sin. Anything that's in the darkness, shine your light on it. I'm giving you permission. There are people that are afraid to look at the darkness in their own life. And they live in that darkness and the kingdom of fear. God says, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. The only people that should stay in the darkness in their own heart are the ones who like the darkness because their deeds are evil and they want to hang on to those deeds. But light has shined and that's God who commanded. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has come. 
I think we're without excuse. It's available. God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has come. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus the Messiah. He shines his light upon our heart. I don't care what darkness there is in me. I welcome day one. Create in me a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life because that hovering spirit of God hovered over chaos. When it says the earth was without form and void, it meant it was chaotic. It was out of order. There was anarchy, chaos. And Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, to this day, the advancement of his kingdom is still swallowing up chaos and anarchy because of his kingdom there is no end. And the government will be upon his shoulders, the Prince of Peace. Shalom or peace is swallowing up the, can the anarchy. It's a militant ability of divine proportions. And that ability starts with God shining the light on the troubled waters of your own heart. He has to shine in the darkness to show you that you have need. And if you just go with your head, well, I, can't, I think I'm, I'm as good as anybody else, or I, I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't killed anybody. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff in your head. But we're talking about the over the dark areas. Believe it or not, there's territory in your heart that has yet to hear the gospel. Your head may have heard the gospel, but it hasn't translated to the rule over all parts of your being. There's still some flesh rule that has uh, wanted to campaign <laughs> against the general manager of the universe. All right? I, I quit. I let Jesus be general manager of the universe. I only campaign occasionally, and you do too. All right? Every now and then you get into self-rule and you want to decree your cause, but... God's basically saying, if we're going to do what David said, and I believe we need this, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. And don't tell me there isn't chaos in your life, because if you're in the world, that's the way it is. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that God's knitting uh, business people together to be a source of peace. As a matter of fact, Pastor Cliff has done that before, where if the boss is unruly as troubled seas tossed to and fro with all kinds of attitudes. They go, they go, Cliff, come on in with us because he calms down when you're around. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? That's the way, that should be a testimony of believers. There's actually some people that calm down in the midst. But I'll tell you what, you can't stand up and say, peace be still, if you can't sleep in the boat. If you can't get peace in here, you don't have any authority to speak, peace be still. It has to be internal. And this is what God wants to do on day one. He wants to shine a light in your darkness. He wants to hover over the chaos and, the, the, and, and, and bring it to order. It's a progressive revelation. But if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. The key to remembering, if we really prayed as a congregation to say, I want to take these seven days of creation and I want you to start giving me a Genesis week. Genesis week, the beginning. Give me the creative uh, as a tactic in my life to draw me closer to a divine embrace. And even that word Genesis uh, in James, when it says when a man looks at his natural face as in a mirror, when you look into the mirror of the word as the law of God, as the Torah, the teaching, when you look into the mirror of the word, you see your natural face. That word natural is Genesis. When you look into the mirror of the word, you see your Genesis face. You see the face of your birth, the new creation. When you look into the mirror of the word, you see your Genesis face, your new creation face, the face of your birth. Now, if you walk away and you forget the kind of man, you'll, you'll walk in darkness then, won't you? But if you continue, and that's a key word that's missing in our English translations, but if you would continue in it, you look into the mirror of the word and, and meet the author of that word and let that reflection shine upon your heart and change you and then continue in it, you'll be blessed in everything you do because that is the will and the intent of God, that you be blessed and be a blessing. Look at your Genesis face. Now, 
If day one, a light shines out of darkness, God commanded that light to shine out of darkness. And he's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus the Messiah. Face means presence. Face is not just seeing something. Face is touching. To seek his face is to literally, and this is the, if you look this up, this is exactly what this means. Your face I did seek, when David said that, seek my face, your face I did seek, your presence as groping in the dark in order to touch. To seek his face is to grope in the dark in order to touch. God's saying, I'm going to shine my light. And I want you to move from darkness to light. That is the first step of day one in creation. Light shined and we are to move from darkness to light. You as a son and a daughter of God, as a new creation, when you look at your Genesis face, your purpose is to move from darkness to light. But how do you move from darkness to light if you won't even acknowledge the darkness? If that darkness in you, if your light is darkness, how dark is your darkness? I think I said that wrong, but you got the point, all right? Um, <clears throat> day one, we move from darkness to light. A light shines in darkness. God basically revealed this to me years ago with judges, that that strategy never remains the same. You want to change life, you're going to have to welcome the light to search the dark areas in your life. None of this, I don't want to see what's in there. Too bad. You need to see what's in there, or otherwise it will overcome you. All right? But darkness in and of itself cannot overcome the light, comprehend the light, dis extinguish the light. That light's going to shine and continue to shine. You can be part of it or not. However, in <clears throat> Judges 6.16, there's a picture of this creation and this strategy, this tactic, and that is that they put the torches after they worked on their heart and they had the 300 warriors out of the 30-some thousand who were not fearful. Wrong kingdom, fear. They were courageous and full of faith and they had clay pitchers, just like we have clay vessels. The torches were inside and the signal for the warfare was to smash the pitchers, let the light shine and confuse the enemy swallow up. Matter of fact, the enemy turned on each other. Wouldn't you like the enemy to turn on each other? Ah. Instead of confusing you, let them be confused. Light shined in a dark place. And God basically is saying that day one, if you want a clean bill of health, if you want a fresh start in God, and you want him to shape a Genesis week in your life, you're going to have to start with step number one. There's a tactic for you. You're going to sit there and say, I'm not going to assume that I'm such a great Christian. Because the lack of repentance is going to be the one thing that's going to hinder an outpouring of God. People are thinking it's going to just fall on them without any preparation whatsoever. It's going to be the ones with preparation that are going to be able to sustain and maintain the power that comes forth in an awakening. Sustain, say that with me, sustain and maintain. Sustain and maintain, that's what I'm concerned about. I want an entity that's strong enough to hold the weight of God and to move forward without being an accident going somewhere to happen because they've got some anointing. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast the devil? Depart from me, I knew you not. You work lawlessness. You have not learned to allow to yourself to be totally under Christ's rule. Now, day one is a new man and the light shines in darkness and it shines in our heart and our heart is to reflect and carry that new nature. Day two. Day two says, then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens and the waters of the earth. And it's interesting, the waters of the heavens and the waters of the earth. He's making a separate distinction. And if we put this in simple language, what God was doing on day one to this new creation us, 
is saying, if I'm going to make a Genesis week, then I'm going to make some separations. I'm going to establish boundaries. Whether you like the boundaries or not, I establish these boundaries. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is evil. I'm making this. I'm saying there's a waters that are going to flow from heaven, and then there's waters that are beneath that spring up mire and dirt, and they're tossed to and fro. Listen to this. It says, let the unstable element of our unregenerate nature become. I saw Isaiah 57, 20. And there's illustrations all through scripture. I'm not going to labor this, but you're being tossed to and fro. That's the unruly waters. But the wicked are like troubled seas when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. All right? Tossed to and fro, tumultuous. Even the scriptures that they've used, deep calleth unto deep. They usually apply that wrong. Deep has to do with the deep turmoils and un under the surface, stirring up stuff, tumultuous, all right? But just stick with the wicked are like the troubled sea. What is God doing on day two? He's saying, I'm making a boundary. I'm a, matter of fact, the first three days of the seven days of creation, the first three days has to do with boundaries, all three of them, light, dark, the waters in the heavens and the waters beneath. This is a tumultuous wicked water that is functioning chaotically. Then there's the waters from heaven. How many know that the will of God is in heaven? <laughs> Everything in heaven is good. The waters that come forth from heaven is the will of God. It's the pleasure of God. It's the goodness of God. It's the will of God. And that there is a river that makes glad the city of our God. And it's pleasure. It's a delight to do his will. All right? I want you to get so in love with the will of God that you don't see it as religious drudgery or an affront to your personal happiness because that's the way a lot of people see the will of God. Oh, if I give myself totally to the will of God, he'll send me to Africa and live in a mud hut. And yeah, that's, that's really the kind of father he is. He's looking out to punish you and make your life miserable. So you better have a plan B to where you're in charge because you know so much better than he does. Now, we know better than that, don't we? But if we're saying, God, give me a clean bill of health, make a fresh start in me, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life, then day one, shine the light in the dark places, the dark places that I don't know about. David said, reveal to me secret sin. They're secret from David. Search my heart, I'm not afraid. For anything you show me, I know the love of my Father wants to bring me from darkness to more light. So I'm not afraid to see darkness because I'm going to do what happens on day two after that light shines in my darkness. And what does he do? I'm going to deal with you. Day two is basically the dealing. I'm separating, saying this is good, this is evil, this is, this is right, this is wrong, this is clean, this is unclean. I'm going to make a distinction. I'm making separations here. And I'm going to deal with you. The wicked is the troubled waters. The heavenly waters are righteous and clean, and pure, and glad, and pleasurable. Now, Hebrews 4.12, isn't that what that really does? Isn't Jesus our light? Isn't the word a light? Isn't the word a lamp unto our feet? Well, that word is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it divides asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So it basically says, I will come with my light and my word, my revelation, my revelation of Jesus. The revelation of his word is a revelation of Jesus. I will come with my revelation and show you light and dark, and then I'm going to have you choose which one you want. You can go either way. But day two is a day of dealing to where I'll make a distinction, and you're not going to be able to Say, I don't know any better. God's going to say, I'm showing you. Day two, I'm going to deal with you, just as the Word of God deals with you. And what does it say? Because he is the light on the first day, he is light, he is revelation, darkness can't comprehend or extinguish it. What does he say? He basically says in verse 13 of Hebrews 4, the Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder, but 
13 says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hiding in the darkness is a waste of time because God sees it anyway. Who are you hiding from? If you're hiding from yourself, you're living in fantasy and you're play acting, you're pretending. It's pretense. It's like whitewashed sepulchers, but full of dead men's bones. Isn't that what he called the religious people? Look good on the outside, but failing to allow light to shine in the dark places is a failure on your part to be true. Now, if day two is dealing, then what's day three? Day three says, Genesis 1, 9 through 13, let the waters beneath and the sky flow together in one place, and so dry ground may appear. That's the clay we're all made out of. Some people said that for every color of dirt there is in the world, there is a race of people. Isn't that interesting? Red, brown, black. I haven't seen any white dirt, but I've seen white sand. <laughs> but anyway, all of that. Out of the earth, earth came forth. But when earth came forth, it's basically that it began the necessity for day three. Day three, create in me a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. Day three, he's still establishing boundaries, but he's saying for stuff to break forth, there must be death, burial, and resurrection. You will never know the, the fruit of what God is doing into your life, but after he deals, this is good, this is evil, Death, burial, and resurrection. John chapter 12 says, except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abides alone. Death, burial, and resurrection. The seed must break open. A tap root must go down before it goes up. You must go down before you go up. So day Resurrection life springs up from death, burial, and resurrection. Did Jesus show himself that same way? And did he not say, you likewise, except the grain of wheat, fall in the ground and die? God's basically saying, <clears throat> fruit will emerge. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn. But at this point... <clears throat> God is basically telling us that Hosea 6.2, this is a good scripture to kind of depict day three. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we might live in his sight. If you let light shine on the first day, he begins to make distinctions and separations and you see this is good, this is evil. He's dealing with you. Then you choose to die to the evil then God says, then no, I'm going to take you from death, burial, to the place of resurrection life. And you're going to see first the blade, then the, then the corn, then the full ear in the corn. You're going to see the, the process take place. But there has to be death, burial, and resurrection on the third day. There has to be a root system. There has to be a foundation. There has to be st stability. Before you go up, you must consider the foundation. It's interesting that at that time, that's the time of the creating of vegetation. Every sort of seed-bearing plant and tree that grows seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And then this is a time of seeds. This is the time where God created in his creativity and said within the seed, everything that's necessary. And within an acorn, everything that's necessary for the oak tree is in there. Everything. But the process, and this is a Genesis week in your life as well, the process remains the same for us. Death, the seed must fall into the ground. It must open, break open, die. The taproot goes down. Die to its self-will, really. Taproot grows down. Die doesn't mean cease to exist. It's the condition of how you exist. Under who, whose authority? Under the law of the spirit of life or under the law of sin and death? So when I say die, that doesn't mean cease to exist. That death means to cease to have rule by self or sin and death. So death, burial, and resurrection 
is falling into the ground. The seed then, we become, how, how were you born again, the new creation? I was born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. So I didn't arrive when I got born again, but to the degree that I behold my Genesis face in the mirror of the word, I'm being transformed from one glory to another level of glory, providing I allow him to deal, die, and let the rule of God rise up in resurrection life. Day three in Genesis, to create a Genesis week, he's still establishing the boundaries, isn't he? He's telling us good from evil. He's telling us what to live for and what to die for. He's telling us what's good, what's evil, what's black, what's white, what's darkness, what's light. The first three days of a Genesis life is really holding the heart open to God and saying, you can go anywhere you want to. If you won't do that, there will be much that God will never reveal to you no matter how long you're a Christian because of the fear of allowing him to put the... The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. That means he didn't care about what you think up here. He says, let me search the heart. Let me pick the cherries and let me tell you what I want to deal with instead of you telling me what you will do and won't do. That kind of self-rule will never know the full embrace of the love of the Father. It will always be a distant concept and there will always be a wall. Day four. Day four shows you, in fact, that the earth will yield. Flesh will yield. The earth will yield. First the blade, then the ear, and the full corn in the ear. That is progressive growth. I can see that as an individual growing becoming less dependent on people, more dependent on God, so dependent on God that they are healthily interdependent. That's the full corn. Some people never get past independent. They can't be interdependent. They haven't matured beyond it because they think they've arrived in their independence. That's actually a teenage syndrome to get to a point where you think you know more than mom and dad. You don't need them. That's, mean, that's a Peter Pan spirit. I mean, I won't grow up. I don't want to grow up. I want to stay like this. I know better. Doesn't take long before you find out that maybe you don't. <laughs> Day four. In Genesis, this is where let there be lights in the space and the heavens divide the day and the night. And basically, this is a time when things begin to bud and bloom. This is, this is the beginning. It wasn't until day four that the boundary's been established, you died to the flesh, and now stuff is actually starting to bear fruit in your life for the first time. God is basically showing you, and as he did with me, he would give me a truth, deal with me on that truth, cultivate that truth, and then in hindsight, have me look back to see if I really saw a change in my life or not. In other words, you shall know them by their fruit, not by lip service, but by their fruit. Can you look backwards and see a changed life? And that's what God's basically saying. On day four, you should be able to, to walk by the sun by day, walk in the light as children of the light from your heavenly father of lights, but at the same time, in the darkness, when you don't know what's going on, let the Lord still be a light. That's when you walk by faith in the night. That's where the word, the revelation, becomes a lamp unto your feet. Because when you're walking in the light that you have, if you walk in obedience, then even the darkness before you, that word is a lamp unto that feet. He will lighten the step in advance. So even in your darkness, you walk by faith. God will be a light to you even in, I mean, darkness is light to him. He can reveal to you what you need to know when you don't know. And so day four is, is actually maturing. Probably our ministry and the emphasis of our ministry, I see all seven of these being repeated again and again and again. People say, oh, the past is dealt with. I don't deal with my past no more. That's a, that's a cop out. They say it's their theology, but in reality, they're unwilling to let God look. There's even some people saying, I don't need to forgive. I, I, I received forgiveness when I first got saved. I don't ever have to forgive again. There's a lot of nonsense. You know what God's going to call it? Lawlessness. Depart from me, I knew you not. I don't need to repent anymore. I repented when I got saved. That kind of teaching is very prevalent. 
But God's saying the sun by day and the moon, you could call that a faith by night, rules at night. And that God is basically saying, remember, someday, someday the sun will no longer be your light, but he himself will be your light. Are you ready for day five? Supposing we matured in day four. Supposing we actually bore legitimate fruit on day four. Day five, this is our favorite. This is Dennis and Jennifer's ministry. It took us to day five to get to our ministry. Actually, all of these are our ministry. But day five, you're going to love this. The various forms of expression are created. Let the waters abound with an abundance of creatures, animals. And here, even the most ancient scholars are in agreement. There's a consensus of the brethren that the, in the creation of the animals, it emphasizes man's emotions. How about that one? Look it up. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. It's amazing how they saw that insight. And that man was to have dominion. And before sin entered, Adam named the animals. And at that point, the lion could lie down with the lamb, couldn't it? And it's going to happen again, where the, lion, where the ferociousness is removed. And it's going to happen with believers that the emotions are going to be under the lordship of Jesus. And as those emotions are ruled, you were called to have dominion over them. They were not to rule over you. Hmm. But the church fathers were in agreement. They said, oh, well, that's, that's, that depicts the emotions. And that's something especially when the church has done everything in its power to not talk about emotions <laughs> for many decades. But now, God's basically saying, the gentle, docile animals that have become wild and attack. God basically says to know the love of Messiah which passes now is that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. When you're filled with all the fullness of God and all the love of God, the love emotions rule. His love rules. And his love and all the fruit of the Spirit is nothing more than the love of God. Love, uh, joy is love rejoicing. Peace is love resting. Love is the primary emotion of God and it's also the primary command. We have an emotional God to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. God's basically saying this is the great commandment to love. So the motivation needs to be the anointing of God over your emotions. And you need to be doing this, and we'll get to this from the place of peace. Now, if God says those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they're going to mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, we know that... that <clears throat> Mount up with wings as eagles close to the sun. The Amplified says, as an eagle mounts up close to the sun, we are to mount up close to the sun, S-O-N. Now, we also know that when Abraham offered his sacrifice, what happened? When he split the animals and was offering and entering into covenant, it said the birds of the air came. He had to shush away the vultures. So you can either be like the eagle, mounting up close to the sun, under the lordship of the rule of Jesus, or the evil one can come and try to devour. As a matter of fact, even in Matthew it says, and he sowed and some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. All right? The enemy wants to eat up the seed. Now, okay, day six is the rule over the animals because day six God created man. And what did he say to man? I'm going to create the fish of the sea, every kind according to its kind. And then, and then, and then, God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth and every other creeping thing that creeps in it. Subdue and have dominion. No one can rule that is not ruled. Power lost when Adam rebelled. Instead of subject, he became independent. So in us, the man has power over the beasts or the emotions, 
only while they remain subject to the lordship of Jesus. I love it because in Revelations 4, it says, In the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like a face of a man, and the fourth was like an eagle. When God called us to establish full stature ministry, the emblem that he gave us was out of Ezekiel 1.10, just like this one in Revelation. The lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man, which is a picture of the fully developed new creation. If a person were to look at their Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four Gospels, you will see Matthew is the king, the lion. Luke is the man. John is deity, the son of God. And Mark, the servant or the ox. Look at those Gospels. That is the emphasis. Matthew is the king and the kingdom. Everything in Matthew is the king and the kingdom from beginning to end. Everything in Mark is the servant of the Lord, the ox. Everything in John is deity, the son of God, the son of God, the son of God. Deity, wings of eagles mount up close to God. And Luke was the man, Jesus the man, over and over and over again. He depicted the perfect man. So I, wanna, I want us to look at that. If, if Luke Pick the perfect man, Mark the servant, John deity. And we are to reign as kings and priests, and we are to reign as children of God and rule as kings and priests. Now, the man, God's plan for man, was how many times have people messed up and said, Oh, I'm just human, All right? I'm just human. Wrong. Jesus exhibits the perfect man in Luke. That is what a man is to be, man or woman. That's what mankind is supposed to look like, Jesus. So no, when you say I'm just human, you mean I'm subhuman because we already have a criteria for the new creation that Jesus was man. Jesus was the perfect man. This is the new creation. He's the picture by the life that he lived, by the death that he died, and the words that he spoke. He depicted the man. We see that God basically said, that my will for man is to sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. And the Apostle Paul says, I was pulled from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. There's your purpose of man. You may have a lot of different gifts and callings, but your primary purpose is to reveal his son in you. You are called from your mother's womb to reveal Jesus. That's your first priority, that his son be revealed in me. Paul said, I'm a little love slave of the Lord Jesus. And that brings us to the, to the lion. The man, he was separated to reveal Jesus. The lion, now we know there's a lion that roams about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. But the lion we're talking about is that awakening that takes place to spirit rule in your life. The real lion means that in Ezekiel 36 I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That is something that we've labored for decades, haven't we, Jennifer? It's because people are burned out striving and trying and they're missing the fundamental basic of the New Testament, which basically says that the rule of God in your life has to do with surrendering and yielding, that God will cause you to walk. There's an empowerment in God. It is God who is at work both to will and to perform. There's an empowering on the inside of you. If you would get out of the way and yield, he would flow and work. And then you would cooperate with that out of a surrendered position. That is the lion rule. The lion rule is also, it's also a warning. In Proverbs it says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Anger is nothing more than a control problem. When you're angry, you're either hurt and then you want to strike out or someone is doing or not doing what you want them to do. When you're angry, you have a control problem. That's not Jesus. That's you. That's your control. So, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
Bullies can get stuff accomplished, but God says the greater one is the one that can rule his spirit. That's the lion. I mean, that's the, yeah, that's the lion. That's the kingliness of the child of God. Proverbs 25, 28 also says, he who has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If you don't have rule over your spirit, the lion of the tribe of Judah is not ruling in the inside of you. You're not acting like a king's kid. Then trust me, the enemy can come into your life and beat you up on a regular basis. If you're a believer and you're beat up on a regular basis, don't tell me you're suffering for Jesus. I'm sorry. Most of the time, it's your own flesh devil doesn't even have to bother with you because you're beating yourself up with your own carnality. <laughs> the walls are not the walls of God's peace to guard your heart and your mind. Therefore, it's flooding in and running roughshod. You're like a city without walls. You're vulnerable. The ox. This is the servant of the Lord. Jesus basically said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If a believer was to enter into the seven days of creation and say, create in me a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. If you took seven days to welcome these principles into your life, the first thing that you'd be doing on, on, on day six here is basically saying, you know, God, uh, come into my heart and I'm going to release all the demands and expectations that I put on myself that other people have put on me. And the only yoke I'm going to wear is your arm around my shoulder. Your yoke of friendship. I'm, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I'm going, to, I'm going to start living for that one. And I'm going to accomplish the purposes for which I sent. Because if you're burdened down, weary, and worn out, you've got some other kind of yoke on you that God didn't put on you. He didn't put that yoke on you you put it on or allowed it to be put on by somebody else. The ox or the labor is that one that says my burden is light and my work is not drudgery but pleasant. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Romans 6.16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You're that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading unto righteousness. You're going to serve somebody why not serve the Lord? You can't say, I'm not serving anybody. You go, oh, then you're serving the devil then. Because the free will is not really free to be alone by itself. It's free to submit to a law. Law of sin and death or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you choose. When you don't choose the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you automatically are choosing the law of sin and death. You're only free to serve a law and you will be a servant to whom you obey. God says, I want the mature believer to be like the ox. I want them to be the servant who knows how to submit to me under my lordship. Because my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And God says, I want you to be like the eagle that soars close to the sun. Just as an eagle mounts up and draws close to the sun, you draw close to the sun. Day seven, create in me a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. On day seven, God basically says, this is when uh, the heavens and the earth were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he has done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, and he rested from all his work. God is looking now, for you, for you to work from the place of that rest as Sabbath sons and Sabbath daughters. Because the strategy of the enemy, Daniel 7.25, is the evil ones going to war against the saints in order to wear out the saints of the Most High God. If you're being worn out, you are more under the influence of the enemy than God. God doesn't wear anybody out. Your flesh the world or the devil has done that to you. God is saying, you want to welcome that rule? I want you individually and corporately to be a house where I can dwell and I can rest. God wants to rest so that we work from the place of that rest. God's basically saying, I want to build up, fit it together, a holy temple, 
that you yourselves are being built up as a habitation of God, a place in the spirit. A habitation means I want to come and rest. But for me to rest in that place, you have to cease from, cease from your own strivings. God rested, not man. And he rested with an internal satisfaction. The day is going to come when God is going to cause us to be like Sabbath sons and Sabbath daughters that we're going to work from the place of rest because we're entering into a season that many have called the day of the saints. We've had the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers. We've, uh, they've all had their day for the purpose of equipping the saints for them to do the work of the ministry. In other words, for them to stand as a priesthood of the believer. We are entering into the day of the saints, but the primary mission is to make ready a people prepared so that they stand in the evil day that regardless of what's going on around them, they've welcomed a Genesis week into the chaos of their life and God's gonna calm the troubled waters. We're gonna learn how to live out of that peace of the seventh day. We're gonna learn how to welcome that light to shine forth. Isn't that interesting that in the message, Psalm 5110, Give me a fresh start, God. Give me a fresh start. Create a Genesis week out of the chaos of my life. Do you want that? Are you willing to allow God to do what he did on those seven days? The first three is going to start establishing some boundaries in your life. He's going to start telling you what, what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what's clean and what's unclean. And then he's going to see if you welcome the work of the cross to death, burial, and resurrection, then you should start to see some growth. And then after you start to see some growth, he's going to say, hmm, you also see that those emotions, emo cognition, emo volition, the emotions are controlling your thinking and the emotions are controlling your choices. Romans 7 is being made manifest in your life. Oh my, what do we do? The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, oh, those things I'm doing. Yes, those emotions need to be brought under dominion and under authority in your life. Then the man begins to rise up as king. He begins to rise up as a servant of the Lord. He begins to rise up as the worshiper and walks, walks in that new creation identity and then becomes a mature man, corporate man, a corporate man that's a testimony to Jesus that he might be lift up his voice and decree and declare through us. Father, we just thank you right now that we are welcoming a Genesis week in the chaos of our life. I ask you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit to shine light in my darkness, to make distinctions and separations. Deal with me. I will allow my flesh to be dealt with and I choose resurrection life. I choose the resurrection of life. I choose not to receive fear and to walk in the light as you're in the light. I choose to be aware of every emotion that wants to usurp itself over my God-given dominion under the Lordship of Jesus to rule over those unruly emotions. I give myself totally and completely to my responsibility to rule and be and fulfill what God had called me to do. To be in dominion because I am under authority. And lastly, to be Sabbath sons. That you're going to teach me in a hostile environment and in the times of chaos and frustration in the world around me, you're going to teach me to walk with the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And peace is going to guard my heart and my mind. I'm going to have peace with God. The God of peace is going to crush the enemy beneath my feet. And I'm going to walk and expand the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Because that kingdom of Sar Shalom, the kingdom of peace, is swallowing up anarchy and chaos to this day. I want to be part and parcel of that purpose to, through my life, swallow up the chaos and the anarchy around that Jesus might be glorified in everything that's done, everything that's said, everything that thought, word, and deed is totally yielded to the Lordship of Jesus. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark. 
of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.